Everyone has questions. Why am I here? Where will I go when I die? Is there really truth? But not everyone has biblical answers. Welcome to The Pastor Study, a ministry of pastorstudy.org. Join us now as we study the Bible to draw closer to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Here is Pastor Tom Brock. Welcome to The Pastor Study. Do you remember or do you know what the Transfiguration is? Once a year, the church observes Transfiguration Sunday but my guess is, if you ask most regular churchgoers, what is the Transfiguration, I'm guessing most won't be able to tell you. So let me tell you the story of the Transfiguration. The year is about 30 AD. Jesus is about 33 years old. He's heading to Jerusalem with his disciples to die on the cross. Before he gets there, I think he knows this is going to be hard on the disciples. So he takes three of the disciples, Peter, James, and John, on top of a mountain. And he gives them this huge mountaintop experience to get them through the big valley that's coming. When he takes them on top of the mountain, Jesus starts to shine brightly. He's transfigured before them. And Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament show up and start talking to Jesus about his departure coming up in Jerusalem. And then Moses and Elijah disappear, and Peter says, Lord, it's good for us to be here. Let me make three little shelters for you and Moses and Elijah. And then this cloud envelops them, and they hear the voice of God the Father. This is my beloved son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And then the cloud went away. Jesus went back to looking normal. They went down the hill and then eventually to Jerusalem, and Jesus was killed. That's called the Transfiguration. What I want to do is learn as many lessons as we can from that story for our personal lives today. So would you take out a Bible, turn to the Transfiguration, Luke chapter 9, and let's pray. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would speak to us through this story of the Transfiguration. If anybody watching this program doesn't quite know who Jesus is, that you will use this story to teach us who the Lord Jesus is. And God, we pray that you bring us closer to you now through this. In Jesus' name, amen. Luke chapter 9, let's read the verse right before the Transfiguration starts. Luke chapter 9, verse 27. Jesus is speaking to the disciples and he says, I tell you truly, there are some of those standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. And some people have read that and thought, oops, Jesus made a mistake because all the disciples are dead and the kingdom of God, the second coming, still hasn't happened. So did Jesus make a mistake here? No, look at the very next verse, verse 28. And some eight days later, after these sayings, it came about that Jesus took along Peter and James and John and went up to the mountain and they see the transfiguration and they see the kingdom of God. <laughs> so here's the first lesson I want you to get. The Bible is always true. Study it through. You might read something in the Bible that looks like, well, that's a mistake or that can't be true. Well, no, study it through, get some good commentaries, look at, all, uh, look at all the verses, and the Bible's always true, but sometimes you really got to think it through. Let me ask you something. Do you have a sympathetic or antagonistic attitude toward the Bible? When I was 13 years old, sitting in confirmation class, I used to enjoy putting up my hand in class and asking the pastor pesky questions, challenging him. In fact, he told my mother, you know, Tommy is a doubting Thomas. And throughout high school, I read my Bible every night, but I kind of argued with it. I kind of had an attitude. And that lasted into college. Finally, in college, I'm, I'm at, a bi at a Christian school taking a Bible course, and I put up my pesky hand, and, and the professor, uh, I said, you know, something, how can that be? And the pastor, the professor said, well, help me out on that one. How do you think that should be resolved? And that kind of was a turning point for me, and I kind of went from having this snooty 
antagonistic view of Scripture to an, a sympathetic view of Scripture. Uh, that, that maybe the Bible's right and I'm wrong, you know. Um, and then I went to Luther Theological Seminary for my seminary training. It's become a radically liberal seminary that I would recommend to no one. Well, some time ago, and they, they very much push feminism and women preaching over men. And so what happened some time ago at Luther Seminary, during chapel service, they read as the appointed scripture for the day, 1 Timothy chapter 2, where Paul says women shouldn't preach over men. Giggling went through the congregation. You know, you can giggle at scripture, but you know what they're doing at Luther now? They're selling off about half of their buildings because the liberal ELCA Lutheran Church and its seminaries are just shrinking. And I think it's because they chuckle at scripture. First point is, give the Bible a break. Have a sympathetic attitude toward the Bible. It's right, and if you think it's wrong, study it through. Get some good commentaries. Next verse is verse 28. Eight days after that, Jesus took Peter, James, and John up on the mountain to pray. Here's the next lesson. A mountaintop is given to get you through a valley. Jesus knows what's going to happen in Jerusalem is going to be real hard on the disciples. And they're going to start thinking, we thought he was the Messiah, and now he's dead? So I think he gives them this mountaintop experience, a little glimpse of who he is, to get them through the valley. And I think God does the same in our lives. Sometimes God knows we're going to go through a tough time, so before it, he gives us a mountaintop. Look at verse 29. And while Jesus was praying, the appearance of his face became different, and his clothing became white and gleaming, literally flashing like lightning. Let me explain what I think is going on in the transfiguration. So follow this, please. Let's say that this candle is God shining in all of his glory. So what we have is the one true God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, shining in all of his glory before the world is made for eternity. And then God creates the heavens and the earth, then you've got all the Old Testament stories. And then one day, about maybe 3 BC, the second person of the Godhead, Jesus, God the Son, comes down from heaven and takes on a human body. And he's still God, but now he's also man. And you can't tell he's God by looking at him. But then one day on the Mount of Transfiguration, just for a moment, God goes Shh, and shows the disciples who Jesus really is. And then he looks normal again, goes down to Jerusalem, dies on the cross, and the veil won't totally be lifted until he rises from the dead. Then everybody sees who Jesus is. That's what the transfiguration is. So here's the next lesson. The transfiguration is a clue. <laughs> the transfiguration is a clue to who Jesus really is. You know, now understand this. I don't think the disciples knew that Jesus was God when he was on earth. Peter knew he was the Messiah. He says, you're the Christ. But did, did the disciples know that Jesus was God in human form? I don't think they got that till Jesus rose from the dead. And Thomas said to Jesus, my Lord and my God. But on the Mount of Transfiguration, they get a big hint that Jesus is God. Look at verse 30. And behold, two men were talking with Jesus, and they were Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament. Now, have you ever wondered, why Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament? Why not Samson and King David, or Jonah and Ruth? I mean, why Moses and Elijah from the Old Testament? Well, Moses gave us God's law, and Elijah was a prophet. So do you know what the Jews call our Old Testament? They call it the Law and the Prophets. And we've got great symbolism here. We've got the Old Testament Law and Prophets shaking hands with the New Testament fulfillment of Moses and Elijah. So here's the next lesson. Jesus is the fulfillment of the Old Testament. It's kind of like at, at the Transfiguration, Moses and Elijah show up, the Old Testament, and Jesus says, 
Okay, thank you, Moses and Elijah, for prophesying me. Now I'm going down to Jerusalem and to fulfill everything you wrote about me. Verse 31. And they were appearing in glory, and they were speaking to him. Here's the next lesson. The dead saints are not dead. They're alive and they're talking. <laughs> you know, I, I, we talked about this on this program many times. Probably the most common question I've gotten in my ministry is, well, Pastor Brock, where is my husband now that he's dead? Is he consciously in heaven right now or is he sleeping until judgment day? And there are two answers to that question. You're, you're an orthodox biblical Christian, either route you go. But the first view is called soul sleep, that when you die, you go to sleep until the resurrection day. Martin Luther believed in soul sleep. And they asked him, what do you think the first thing you hear will be once you're dead? And he said, I expect to hear someone knocking on my coffin. Time to get up, Dr. Luther. Luther believed in soul sleep. Most of the Lutheran church didn't follow him on that because there's a second view. It's called being immediately with the Lord. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you'll be with me in paradise. Not 2,000 years from today. In Philippians, Paul talks about, I'd rather go be with the Lord. That's far better than being on earth. Well, that doesn't sound like sleep. But there's a big hint in this verse that, that you're not sleeping. But why? Because Moses and Elijah, they're not sleeping. They're awake and they're talking. <laughs> so... How do you reconcile? Because there are scriptures that talk about going to sleep and being raised on the last day. And there are scriptures that talk about immediately being with the Lord. We'll follow this. I think it'll help. If your husband is dead and he was a believer in Christ, I think he's consciously with Christ right now. His spirit is in heaven. But he doesn't have his perfect new resurrection body in which he will live for eternity. He won't get that until the second coming when Christ returns and all the dead are raised and perishable, and that's when you get your new body. So I think both are true. All right, let's look at verse 31. They were appearing in, in glory to Christ, and they were speaking of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. I discovered something reading this verse. Um, <clears throat> The word departure there in Greek is the word, where am I here, is the word exodus. Now follow this. Moses is the Old Testament exodus man. And they're talking about Jesus and his upcoming exodus out of this planet at the crucifixion. So here's the next lesson. The new exodus is this. Moses saved from Pharaoh. Jesus saves us from Satan. Let's, let's repeat that. In the Old Testament, Moses saved the Jews from Pharaoh into the promised land. In the New Testament, Jesus saves everybody from Satan to get him into the promised land. So Moses is, is and Elijah are talking about Jesus' upcoming exodus, which is, is filled with symbolism. Verse 32. Now Peter and his companions had been overcome with sleep. But when they were fully awake, they saw Jesus' glory and the two men, Moses and Elijah, standing with them. I want you to notice the word glory there. It also appears earlier in verse 26 where they're talking about the second coming, glory. So here's the next lesson. The transfiguration is a preview of the second coming. Uh, you're going to see Christ's glory when he returns. But what happens on the Mount of Transfiguration, we get a little preview of what that's going to be like. Verse 33. And it came about as they were parting from him, Moses and Elijah, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. And let us make three booths, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Peter not realizing what he was saying. <laughs> Here's the next lesson. Christians are not meant to live on the mountaintop. Peter wants to build three little houses and let's just stay up here forever. And God says, nope. <laughs> uh, Lang was a commentator on the Bible and he said this years ago. God lets his people have, even in this world, extraordinary glimpses of himself, but they are only of short duration because their longer enjoyment would not be profitable. In other words, you're not supposed to live on the mountaintop. This happens when you take kids to Bible camp. It happened to me when I was 17. You go to Bible camp. 
You get so close to God. And then you go home and everything's normal again. And did I lose my relationship with the Lord? No, you didn't. Uh, we're not supposed to live on the mountaintop. The valley is where we normally live. Uh, Martin Luther was a monk in Germany in the 1500s, but he got to the place where he didn't believe in, in monasteries. He didn't think Christians should be off on a hill somewhere praying. He thought Christians should be right down in the culture sharing the gospel. In other words, we're not to be living on the mountaintop, we're to be down in the valley spreading the gospel. And isn't it good that Peter didn't have three houses built and they stayed up there forever because then Jesus never would have gone down to Jerusalem, died on the cross, and saved our souls. So I, I want to encourage you, um, don't be one of these Christians who always is trying to live on the mountaintop. There are some churches that all they do is go from one emotional high to the next emotion. They whip up their emotions. I don't think anything's wrong with emotions and being close to the Lord emotionally. That's great. But you don't live up there. <laughs> we live in the valley normally. Look at verse 34. And while Jesus was saying this, well, excuse me, while Peter was saying this, a cloud formed and began to overshadow them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. Here's the next lesson. A close encounter with God can be terrifying. You know, I, I won't share the whole story, but when I was 16 years old, I started to doubt whether God was really there. I still believed, but I had my doubts. So I asked God to give me proof. And one night, he did. And I won't go into it. But it was terrifying. And tears were running down my cheeks. And I remember for years, I would pray before I went to bed, God, you don't have to visit me tonight. <laughs> have you ever had a close experience? Sometimes it can be absolutely terrifying. Um, verse 35 and a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. This leads us to the last and the biggest lesson of the transfiguration. Here it is. Listen to Jesus. This is the main lesson. The reason it all happened. Peter, James, John. Listen to Jesus. Yesterday, I went over to Bethel University. I graduated from Bethel years ago. And now and then I go over there because I'm real nostalgic. And I kind of walk around the halls and prepare, prepare, uh, pre pre pretend I'm 21 years old. Had lunch. Then I went to chapel. And the preacher got up at chapel. And he preached about our cell phones. And he, he made the point that people are listening so much to their cell phones, it's hurting their marriage, it's hurting their personal relationships, hurting their relationship to God. So, and I have a problem, I gotta pray about because I spend too much time on the internet. And so I looked down the row of these college students next to me. During a sermon, three of them were on their cell phones. And then I looked at the two people right in front of me in the next row. Both of them during the sermon, are looking at their cell phones. <laughs> you know, what we need to do in our culture, we need to turn off the cell phones, the internet, the TV, and spend much more time listening to Jesus. Let me ask you the question. Do you spend time, or who do you spend time listening to? There's a story from Greek mythology of Jason and the Argonauts. They want to get past the island of the sirens. Do you know who they were? These sirens were these beautiful naked ladies on this little island, and they'd sing these beautiful songs, and the sailors would turn their ship toward the island of the sirens, and their, their ships would be wrecked on the reefs, and they'd die because of the sirens. Well, <clears throat> the story in ancient mythology goes that Jason wants to get his men by the island, so he hires Orpheus, the sweet singer of Greece, to sing them a, such a more beautiful song that they passed the island of the sirens and weren't even tempted because they were listening to Orpheus. Do you know how we get over our sins and our lures and our flesh? It's not by trying real hard not to listen to the devil. That doesn't work. We got to hear a sweeter song. We got to hear somebody more enticing and more beautiful. And that's why God the Father says, this is my son. Listen to him. So when I, 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 I like to on my iPhone, when I can't get to sleep at night, I have Bible.is app and I push the button and it reads the Bible to me out loud. 
Or if I'm making pottery, and this is my hobby, I, I, I'll listen to Bible CDs. Or I'll drive in the car sometimes and listen to Christian music. So uh, listen to him. There's another story from Greek mythology. Odysseus wants to get his men to sail past the island of the Sirens, and he knows it's going to be dangerous. So Odysseus takes wax, and he puts it in the ears of all of his men, and they sail by the Sirens. We need to put wax in our ears when it comes to the devil. I mean, for instance, I was raised in a house where I discovered my dad's pornography when I was eight years old. So that can be an allurement. So you know what I do to, to put wax in my ears? On my iPhone, I have covenant eyes. On my computer, I've got covenant eyes. You pay a little bit every month, and it protects you, and it blocks out all the bad stuff. That's my way of putting wax in my ears and to listen to Christ and not to the devil. One last point, though. When it comes to Jesus, we need to get that wax out of our ears and listen to him. Years ago, I went to the doctor. He puts the flashlight in my ear and goes, ooh. He takes out a knife and he goes in and he digs out in each ear. It really hurt. And then he put these two round, hard balls of wax in my hands. And so, okay, and I go back to the office and I lean back in my chair and I hear, squeak! And somebody knocks on the door and I said, come in, and they open the door, squeak! And I started hearing this stuff that, I don't know, I hadn't heard for years. <laughs> My question for you is, do you have wax in your ears toward God? Has God been talking to you maybe for years about something, and your heart has become so hard you can't even hear anymore? No, no, listen. Here's what I urge you to do from the story of the transfiguration. God the Father says, this is my son. Listen to him. The, the more you listen to him when you read your Bible. Read your Bible every day. That's the way to listen to him. Go to church every week. Listen to Christian radio. Listen to uh, Christian television. Uh, 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 listen to worship tapes. Go to church regularly, like I said, but the more the more you can listen to him, the safer you will be, and the more you will get past the island of the sirens. <laughs> Amen. Welcome to the portion of the pastor study where we now ask Pastor Brock to share with us his knowledge of Scripture and his insights to answer questions we have regarding the Bible, our Lord, and our everyday walk with him. Pastor Brock, you said the Transfiguration teaches that Jesus is God. Are there other Bible verses that teach this? There are, and I hope everybody at home gets out your pen and pencil, or your pen and paper. We're gonna put on the screen right now some of the places in the New Testament that teach Jesus is God. You might wanna write these down in case Jehovah's Witnesses come to your door telling you, no, he's not God. Here are the verses that say, yes, he is. John chapter one, John chapter five, John chapter 14, John chapter 10, and especially John chapter 20, verse 28, where Thomas calls Jesus God and Jesus accepts it. Then you've got Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 2, Hebrews chapter 1, Philippians chapter 2, Jesus was in the form of God, but emptied himself and came down to earth. Then Luke chapter 8, verse 39. You might want to write all those verses down. Maybe we'll leave them up for another 30 seconds because those are the verses that teach that Jesus is the eternal God. There's only one God but in the one God are Father, Son, Jesus, the Holy Spirit. Okay, were John the Baptist and Elijah reincarnated? Right. The Old Testament teaches that before the Christ appears, Elijah will come first. And Jesus said, John the Baptist was Elijah. So John the Baptist showed up before Jesus appeared and he was the fulfillment of the prophecy that Elijah will appear first. Now, we don't want to over-literalize that because we don't believe in a reincarnation. The Bible in Hebrews teaches you die once and then there's judgment, you don't keep coming back to earth. So, John the Baptist was not a literal reincarnation of Elijah, but it says in the Bible that John came in the spirit of Elijah. So he had the same spirit or attitude or, or power from God, yeah. Okay, some people say they're contacting their dead one, loved ones in yeah. that. Is it wrong to try to contact your dead loved ones? Yeah, they, I mean, when people go to psychics or they dial 1-800-PSYCHIC, uh, that's all a sin, Jackie. 
because the Bible says it's an abomination to try to contact the dead. They're in heaven, they're in hell, they're not on earth trying to get messages from you. I think some of that stuff is, is just chicanery, but I think some of it might be demonic, so that a demon can pretend to be Uncle Louie and try to get control of your life. So stay away from seances, stay away from Ouija boards, stay away from the occult. Very quickly, what's going to happen at the second coming, Tom? The second coming of Christ will occur, could, uh, could occur tonight, Jackie, and we'll hear trumpets. Jesus comes down in the clouds. All the dead are raised, and then he judges us. Those who trusted Christ go to heaven. Those who rejected him go to hell, and then the earth melts with fire. And that'll all happen on the very last day. Okay. We got one more minute. What are some ways that we can hear the voice of Jesus yeah. today? The main message of the transfiguration is, this is my son, listen to him. Well, that means we have to turn off the iPhone or turn it on to the Bible, Bible dot is app, B-I-B-L-E period I-S. And it, Jackie, I love to listen to the Bible when I'm, when I'm laying in bed because it reads it out loud to you. But, so the main way we hear the voice of Jesus is through the Bible. But then you also need to be in a good Bible preaching church where the pastor is preaching the Bible. You need to uh, you know, listen to Christian radio, Christian TV, and just fill yourself with, with listening to Christ. Yeah. So can a person tell the voice of Jesus from their own thoughts? That can be hard, which is why, we, you know, sometimes people confuse their own thoughts with the voice of the Holy Spirit, and that's why we, we need to read the Bible, because the Bible is the final arbiter in all that. And everybody, we're done, so Jackie, why don't you say goodbye? Thanks for being with us this week, and we pray that God will be with you, granting you his richest blessings until we're all together again next time. Thank you for watching the Pastor Study. You can watch more of our programs at pastorstudy.org. We are on the air preaching the gospel of Christ because of our generous support of you, our viewers. Would you consider supporting our ministry? You may do so at pastorstudy.org. Or write the Pastor Study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota 55441. May the blessing of our one triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you today and always. If you've been blessed by the pastor's study, would you consider a tax-deductible gift to help us reach more people with the good news of Jesus Christ? You can donate at our website, pastorsstudy.org, two S's, or mail a check to the pastor's study, P.O. Box 41294, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55441. May the Lord bless you and have a wonderful week.